Well, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Jamie Maslin. I'm your presenter um, for today. Uh, hopefully you find the, the topic uh, really interesting and, and worthwhile and, and very, and more importantly, very helpful to you. Um, I'd just like to remind uh, everyone as they're, they're joining here, there'll be times for questions uh, at the end. Uh, if you want to write them down, put them in the question box. They'll be read out by the webinar uh, manager uh, at the end of the, the session. Um, and there'll also be handouts. Uh, the handouts for the, the presentation will be available to you. Um, so I said, my name's Jamie Maslin, uh, Technical Director for Asset Management uh, here in Australia, and part of the you know the Australian uh, Strategic Asset Management Team. We're very fortunate to have a great team uh, there. Uh, you know, uh, helped and supported by um, you know Toby Holstead, who's a board member on the Asset Management Council, Rami Afan, who's Executive Director for Asset Management at Infrastructure New South Wales, and we're also part of the, the global team, uh, you know, spearheaded by uh, Christian Roberts there, who's the, the president of the Institute of Asset Management. So not only in Australia, but uh, worldwide and part of the global connection, we've got a very, very strong asset management team uh, and enables us to really do some great stuff to help our, our clients and also build their capability of our teams as well. So we're just going to go through today, we're going to be talking about uh, how to get executive support for asset management change, which is uh, always an interesting uh, challenge for us all, uh, something that comes up quite a lot. So I'll just go through there now. Um, and um, so how do you approach the uh, the executive leadership teams and uh, and get that change and support that you need? Well, look, I've got uh, 25 years of, of some successes and quite a few failures in, in gathering executive support. And I'm going to share what's worked with you and uh, and potentially what uh, what hasn't worked and things that you might want to avoid as well. So the session is going to cover uh, some of the uh, the key topics, uh, key preparation presentation tactics that you might want to consider. And we're talking about planning here. What should be considered when planning to approach the executive team? We'll go through culture and the impact of individual cultures and organisational cultures. We'll also go through some tactics. Um, uh, you know about EL, the EL, uh, sorry the executive leadership team or ELT as we call them, um, their behaviour and how to be prepared for their type of behaviour and also the techniques, which is your behavior and how to listen, you know, how to use your behavior to elicit the response you're, you're after. Now, it's important to remember that this is not a 100% guaranteed answer to all of the all too common problem. You're not guaranteed, but what this will do uh, is give you a much greater chance of success to achieve the outcome you, you want. There will be times where depending on the timing or, or variety of factors, it's just not possible to get those uh, those outcomes that you're after, but what it will give you is some ideas where you can come back potentially and regroup if it hasn't been successful, work out why, and then maybe regroup for another attempt. So I wonder how many people uh, on this webinar have ever faced this same issue uh, at some stage. Um, have you ever had a great idea that could get help the business, but have failed to get that executive leadership team to support it? Well. Why is that the case? I think we all have at some stage. And you know, when you think about what that could be, are they too busy? Couldn't we justify the argument? Did we not have enough money or bad timing, personality conflicts, whatever it might be? I mean, failing to get executive leadership team support for business change is often the main reason you have a great asset management plan that remains a great idea and it just fails to launch. You know, if I look at this interesting quote by Dwight Eisenhower, uh, Dwight Eisenhower there, you know, leadership is the art of getting someone else to do something you want done because he wants to do it. Sort of slightly interesting that uh, you know diversity may not have been a big thing back in Dwight's day. Um, he was only talking to to men, but basically the concept is, you know, we lead, as leaders, we're trying to get and explain to people that we want them to embrace something because it's a great our idea. We want them to to follow and support our idea. And that is a key part of leadership. And as asset managers, we are leaders. So, so an aim improvement uh, really uh, typically start with an idea uh, from the asset management senior management team, who then push down traditionally to the operations team in an attempt to make you know, incremental changes. This has been the typical way that we've had to operate in the past. You know, and the le executive leadership teams are quite often traditionally removed from this process often believing you know that it's a routine maintenance program rather than managing assets to achieve better business outcomes but asset management is a corporate function it requires the support from the entire organization to succeed so it stands to reason that any improvement opportunities require 
and aligned view to support and support from the entire business to achieve if it is really a corporate function, which asset management really is. So how do we secure this support? Well, as asset leaders, we have a role to play to engage the, the executive leadership team in the program and its benefits to the organisation. We do have a responsibility to try and elicit that support and make them aware of what the benefits are. So if we want organisational change, then we part of our role is to push up to the executive leadership team and inform them of the benefits of the program. Now, whether you're starting on a program of uh, you know, uh, transactional improvement or looking to embed transformational change, and they're two very concepts, different concepts, we'll talk about that a bit later. Any success you get will be short-lived if the entire organisation is not aligned to the benefits that that program will deliver. All business change activities require leadership to succeed, and if that change affect the entire enterprise, as asset management undoubtedly does, then all levels of the enterprise must have that mandate to lead that activity when required and the autonomy to exercise that leadership. Roundabout way of saying that uh, if you can secure the support of the executive leadership team, then you have a much easier task to push down to the operational teams to embed those wonderful changes if this is actively supported by the executive leaders from each department. Okay. But why? Makes sense, pretty easy, it's good for the business, everyone should be involved, it's a corporate function. Why is this so difficult? Well, if we look at a typical organisational structure, we sometimes we can get a pretty good clue as to why this is more difficult than it really should be. I mean, what we've got on here is a representation of a fairly typical organisational executive structure. CEO, uh, finance, a couple of different business units, you know, they might have a few more, a few less, but basically this is a typical executive leadership team. And asset management, unfortunately, generally sits, uh, you know, as, as part of a different group. It rarely has a seat at the table in its own right. It's usually part of a larger business user, quite often finance, um, you know, it might even be uh, part of uh, the operations team, but quite often part of finance. And part of the problem that you have with that is that, well, and un not unsurprisingly, asset management is not really seen as a key focus for that executive leader of that finance department. They're busy focusing on their main task, which is finance. I mean, even if they were part of the operations team, again, they're often seen as the, you know, the maintenance team rather than part of the success of the operations function. So that's a challenge. You don't have a seat at the table. You're not seen as a core function. To make it even worse, uh, this is a, a great study, a challenge that was done, uh, you know, a study that was done in New South Wales government a few years ago that the average CEO now has only an average tenure of just three years. And it's probably less now, to be honest. So, so with the return on investment from AM asset management improvements, often taking several years to materialise, it's, it's no wonder that it can be difficult to get a CEO excited about something that won't happen you know, while they're in charge, it's going to benefit their successors and make them look good, not them. So, you know, you don't have a seat at the table. It's not part of the core function potential of the people you're reporting to. And even if it was, the CEO doesn't get excited by stuff because it's going to come after they've left. So these are some of the challenges that we face in trying to get that support. So how do you convince the executive leadership team to support you? Well, after 20 odd years of a few successes and many, many failures, I finally asked the same question to myself. So I went back and looked at uh, some of the different approaches and the outcomes that I achieved, and I aligned those to some published behavioral science techniques and factors that influence human behavior. Okay, and what I was able to reveal was there were four key activities that had a profound impact on the ability to gather executive support I was after. Okay, today we're gonna to share what's worked and just as importantly, what to avoid. Okay, so let's look at these sort of four success factors that we could see. And again, these are led very much by behavioral science and, and human behavior tactics, not by the strategy or the plan uh, behind the idea. It's about how to elicit that response. So we're talking about planning there. What should you consider when planning the approach to the executive team? The cultural impacts, what are the cultural considerations you need to have? The tactics as well, the ELT behavior and how to be prepared for for their behavior and the techniques that you will use about to your tactics, your techniques to elicit that response. Um, Dan Gregory was a man that was doing a, a session just before me at a, at, a, at a conference recently, and he was talking about change in the, in business uh, yeah, in general, uh, and a lot of the comments he was making, I've got these comments there, were very similar to, to what we're talking about. How to engage, we have to get better to engage with people. 
who are different to us. So let's look at the first activity, planning, how to plan your approach. The right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing by Josh Harris, absolutely. So it leads very nicely into the first, first activity, timing. Uh, timing, keep your powder dry if you can. Wait until an opportunity arises that can make your offer more attractive. If it's a great idea, but if it's the wrong thing at the wrong right thing at the wrong time, well, it's the wrong thing. Simple. Keep it. Keep it to the. It's going to have the best impact. Look, this is a great consideration for planning blockers. These are very real issues in a lot of organisations, and particularly within government. It's not unusual to have someone uh, between you and the executive that tells you openly that they support your idea, but privately they see it as potentially a possible risk to them personally, and they don't push your agenda. And they would uh, unfortunately they're almost blocking you when they're pretending to actually support you. Uh, political climate, again. These are some of the planning you might want to consider. This is changing faster than ever. And if your plans can support a sudden political focus, have it you're ready to pounce on the emotive response to that political announcement. So again, government particularly are, are, are susceptible for that. And community social pressures, current social issues of the day. Okay, uh, again, this can provide a moral imperative that can add support to your proposal if you, if you place it at the right time. So plan for, to take advantage of these things. You know, for example, if right now, if you're possible to portray any opportunity to the executive leaders as helping to open up new enterprises that say supported a return to work for, for COVID affected female workers in marginalized areas, then now might be a fantastic time to pitch that argument if you can link it to that sort of an outcome. So the second activity that will help you in achieving your outcomes is, is culture, appreciating culture. So if we look at um, this quote there from the Harvard Business Review back in 2003, we discover that employees who work for the same corporation are 30% more likely to exhibit similar leadership than people who do the same job but work in different com uh, companies. So, you know, people tend to gravitate to other organisations and people that think and act the same way as they do. Like as engineers, we're often called the blue shirt brigade. So everyone wears a blue shirt because we act and think much the same as everybody else. So that's why we feel comfortable. So if all the ex executive leadership teams are likely to share the same set of values, you should recognise these values and align your proposal to them as well. Makes sense. So. Your proposal, when you're considering these cultural impacts, should target the following few things. You know, you should have, you should be targeting, targeting that uh, the organisational values. Okay, um, this opportunity supports who we are as an organisation. Okay, so again, if you look down the corner there, that Dan Gregory uh, made a great comment. Align your value with your values. So the value of this proposal is aligned with the values of the business, whatever it might be. So we have to make sure we get that alignment. The other one there is uh, alignment to the individual. Okay, try to link it to the individual as well. This also speaks about what you expose. This proposal is about your values, it's about the business values plus yours. So you're trying to make a connection so they are more likely to want to uh, you know, support your idea. Then the day, of course, it still has to be meeting the organisational goals. Um, so not only is it about who we are and who you are personally, and what the business is about, but it also is what the business is here to do. So you need to make that connection. And this is the other one, which we are talking about a bit earlier. Uh, determine if you're pitching transactional change, which is about following process better, or transforming transformational change, which is about looking for innovation. That comes from a, a great quote from Living Asset Management by Lafreyer and Hardwick. Uh, a really good consideration and something that I think a lot of us may have learned over the years that you can go to uh, an organisation and say, oh, I've got an amazing idea which is really going to change the world. It's going to be fantastic, but if they're not ready to change the world, they're just trying to get things in place at the basic level, that change might be too much. So at the same token, if you're going to come to an idea of just doing the same things but a bit better, they might be ready to say, look, we've got to do things completely different because that's not working anymore. So you have to understand is it's transactional that you're looking for or transformational. If you get that wrong, um, you know, your pitch is really, really going to struggle to get support. Now this third activity we're talking about um, there now, um, oh, sorry, that's a great quote there. Culture eats strategy for breakfast, Peter Drucker. Absolutely. If you get the culture wrong, you change, no matter how good your strategy is, if you don't align your outcomes to the, the culture you're trying to, uh, trying to work within, um, then you, your chances of success are, are, are pretty slim. So, okay. 
So the third tactic, uh, third outcome or activity we're looking for is tactics. Okay, tactics. The you know we're talking about the tactics to use on the executive leaders, um, you know, to target their behaviour and knowing their response triggers. People will alter their mindsets only if they see the point of change and agree with it. Pretty fair enough. I'm not going to do it if I don't think it's a good idea. Well, we're going to target. We're going to use some tactics to target those those uh, outcomes those, and, and try to elicit that response from from those um, executive leaders. So uh, let's let's have a look at a couple of those. Um, again, if you want me to care, from Dan, if you want me to care, link your solution to something I care about. It makes good sense. So some of the behavioural tactics we can use on the executive leadership team. One of those things is you need to believe in your solution. Now, uh, in all my life of working with senior leaders and, and executives, I think I've only ever come across one uh, who was a bit of a buffoon and really shouldn't have been there. I don't know how that person actually made it, but the rest of them, very, very smart, intelligent people, knew their business, earned their spot at that executive table, uh, and were no dummies, and really they could smell problems or issues or a lack of belief a mile away. If you don't believe in your solution and you don't know it backwards, they'll work it out pretty quick. If you want to convince them and you want to, and, and that it's a great idea, well, you probably truly need to believe it and you need to project that you believe that. Look, this is a great tactic to use on the preload. Speak to the executive individually beforehand if you can, or research so you know what triggers a response personally. So remember, one, one executive can shoot you down and sink your pitch in the middle of an organisation, in the middle of a group there. You only need one and you're shot. Preloading, you know, if you talk to an executive, you have the opportunity saying, I'm really looking forward to speaking you, to you next week. I've got a great idea. It's going to help you. You're going to love this because this is going to solve a problem you've been dealing with for ages. By preloading, they already go into that meeting thinking there's something good for me coming. Okay, it's a really, really good tactic. Again, another tactic, be brief. Executives are overloaded with information. Short, sharp, give it to them in the format, get it in, hit the mark, get out. Okay, um, they don't have time to sit there and, and interpret, give it to them, give it to them fast. And use lingo, they use the lingo that they, they know and speak accordingly in a way that that uh, works. So do your study, understand the right tactics here to use and how to speak to them in their lingo. Um, I, you know, I did a presentation to, to a, a leadership group at uh, Defence quite a few years ago. I often tell people it's probably the worst presentation. I wasn't prepared. I didn't understand how to speak in their acronyms. Um, it was a dismal failure, lack of lack of understanding how to speak to them. The rest of the connections were, were a waste of time. Okay, so, um, okay, um, with them, why do I care? Um, part of the tactics when you're presenting, um, you know, make sure that you're presenting something that uh, if you do nothing, this could hurt you. So this is gonna trigger a response from, these are the tactics you use. At the same time, you then follow that up by, if you do this, however, this will save you. You know, so these are some of the tactics you should be using, you know, to try and get that response you want. But at the end of the day, you still need to show that there will be some return on the investment for the business, and you need to be able to, you know, demonstrate that in whatever form of value means something to the business. So it could be financial, it could be social, it could be you know, reliability, whatever it is, you still need to be able to demonstrate and have that tactic up your hand to say, this is this is going to make the whole business look good as well. Okay. So looking at that fourth and last technique we've got, uh, methods, you know, techniques, methods to use to get your outcome. These are your techniques that you're going to be using while you're presenting. So you've done all this prep work, you've got your tactics in place, you've done your planning, what techniques are you going to use during that delivery to elicit that response? Um, great, uh, great comment there from uh, George Carlin. Never underestimate, underestimate the power of stupid people in large groups. Absolutely, we mentioned before, one person in the executive leadership team can shoot you down. Executive leaders tend to work in the in a pack. If one person says it's a bad thing, quite often they all fall in line with that person. They tend to tend to coalesce around that there. So you don't want to give that one person the opportunity who's uninformed or whatever to say something negative because they can take the rest of the group with you. So what are some of the persuasion techniques you can use to influence that ELT when you get that opportunity in front of them? Okay, again, be confident, speak with authority. People want to listen to and support people they trust. So if you speak with authority, they'll feel comfortable that you're informed. It's important to look and sound knowledgeable about your subject and believe in it. So you need to speak that way so they feel comfortable. They want to support you. You're there in front of them, they want to support you, but they want to feel comfortable that that's a good thing to support. 
These are techniques to try and elicit the response you want. Mirroring. This is again, and I'm using some of these psychology techniques that are, are well documented. People, uh, you know, often, you know, if you mirror style people, it's a natural behaviour for uh, for people to uh, to gravitate to others that they see as like them. So if people stand or act or talk or whatever in a certain way, if you mirror that behaviour, they naturally feel more comfortable. They're like me, so I'm more comfortable to feel comfortable to you know to to support them because they're more like me. Okay, flattery. I mean, <laughs> if you talk to some of the best uh, influence around the world, they'll talk about flattery to the cows come home. Absolutely, this works. If you tell people, it's a natural behaviour. If you tell people, oh, gee, I like the way you, you look, your style, your, your hair, your, you know, your outfit, whatever it might be, people naturally feel com more comfortable. I mean, is anybody, I don't know if any of you guys uh, remember, if someone said something nice about you, it probably made you feel more comfortable in their presence. Flatteries are just a way of disarming people away from a tendency to block you out, make them feel more comfortable and more open to listening to your idea. Uh, another tactic, uh, the persuasion technique you can use is return on favours before you get there. Again, it's a natural tendency for people to want to return favours. So if you have the opportunity um, you know, to, to do something good for them leading up to this opportunity, do so because by the time you get into that, uh, that meeting with them, they're almost, it's almost a subliminal type of a, you know, a, you know, a, a suggestion to them to want to get them to then return their favour. These things do work. Now, again, if you talk to speakers, this is probably one of the best techniques, persuasion techniques you could possibly use at NYH. It's called nod your head. Okay, nod your head. This has just got to be one of the best techniques. People, I use this all the time. People use this on me. Tom, they do. I laugh when I get caught about it. But if you're talking to somebody and you start to nod your head, other people, and do this, you know, you guys can do this, uh, you know, practice this as well. Other people start to nod their head as well. So they're basically agreeing with you. And it's very difficult for people to disagree with you while they're nodding their head in agreement with you. You know, it's, it's an extraordinary technique. But by nodding your head, you're almost reinforcing to those person that this is a good idea and they're agreeing with you. And it just makes it very difficult for them to, to disagree. Nod your head. It's just one of the great tactics. Yeah. Social proof. If others, particularly people of eminence, think it's a good solution, then the audience are much more likely to do the same. They don't just believe me, believe everybody. I've been doing this all through this presentation with our, our comments there from, from uh, some other people there to, to reinforce that this is a great idea. This is just not my idea. It's somebody else's idea, it's everyone's idea, so why wouldn't you go along with it if everyone else is doing it? I mean, if you look at, uh, say, for instance, YouTube and you're looking for a, an instruction video, if you've got one that's got 50 views and another one's got 50,000 views, well, which one are you more likely to go for? Yeah, the one with the 50,000 views, because that social proof is there to say more people believe this is a good idea. I'm going to believe it's a good idea. Absolutely. And look, one of the, uh, sorry, oh, here's an interesting comment. <laughs> Has anyone ever, you know, you might be a consultant or you might be working for industry. Has anyone ever got a consultant report to say the same thing as you, just so the executives take notice? Yeah, it's a form of social proof. Somebody else of eminence has said this is a good idea, not just me. So it's more likely for you to accept that that's a great idea. Absolutely. And another great uh, technique you can use when you're presenting, just say, look, this is in short supply. If you don't rush up to this solution, somebody else is going to get it. So you really need to take advantage of it while you've got the opportunity, whatever it might be. Again, a fantastic technique to try and elicit that response. So in summary, if you want to have the best opportunity to get that all important support from the executive, there are four key activities you know, I'd like you to consider when you're trying to, uh, to go through that exercise again. So you plan your approach and get the best effect from the best possible timing, okay? And ensure your uh, proposal aligns with the personal uh, and organizational values and goals of the ELT and the business. So you've got your planning approach, your culture technique, you then got your tactics. Okay, get to know the ELT members, what appeals to them, how to speak to them, what do they like and what do they worry about and what can they get excited. If I'm speaking to an executive leadership team on behalf of a client, I now always ask, can you give me some details about who they are, what they like and what their personal interests are? Okay, if I can craft my discussion to something that they appeal to, to make them less likely to have to block out the idea and more welcoming and open to our suggestion, then I'll use that. I'm gonna use any tactic I can. Um, and, and the fourth one is techniques, okay? Use these persuasive techniques or subconscious behavior triggers in your delivery so you can appeal to them more personally. 
you know, the important thing is to remember here, you have an amazing idea that's going to be brilliant for the organization and, and they'd, be, you know, they'd be crazy not to support it. These are not tricks that we're using. These are tactics, techniques and planning and culture understanding. What we're trying to do is remove you know, artificial blockers um, caused by a variety of reasons. Uh, so your executives are more open to understanding the value of your proposition. If I need to use techniques or tactics or certain types of planning to achieve that, I will because I believe this is a great idea. I don't think there's any problem with this. Uh, and I've never had an issue with, with behaving and I'm very, very open in telling people that I use these techniques and these tactics to do that. And people are very, very comfortable. My aim is to make sure people are in the best position to be able to appreciate the value of this opportunity without having something that's officially gonna block them. If they then decide not to take that up, well, that's okay, but I'm trying to put myself in the best position to give them the best opportunity to understand the value. Now, so that brings us to the end of our session and uh, we're gonna open up for questions now, but um, firstly, before we do, I'd just like to remind you that the next webinar sessions are, are running shortly, starting with a great session by Gary Rikers in about two weeks time. Uh, sorry, next week, and then a further two in November, and then uh, and then we've got some more coming in, in January as well. So look out for those. There'll be some great sessions coming up. But with that, I'd just like to uh, to thank you, uh, and I'm just going to uh, hand over to the webinar convenor, and we're just going to open up for some questions there. So I'm just going to hand over to you there, Sharon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie, for a fantastic presentation. So before moving into the very short uh, Q&A period, unfortunately, um, I would like to remind attendees to enter your questions in the question box on the GoToWebinar platform. We'll do our best to read your question. Uh, otherwise, uh, Jamie will be answered directly by email. Also, the PDF of the, this presentation is available to download from the handout box. I will start with the first question. We received a fantastic question from uh, someone who registered. Um, it's one thing to get support for, of top management, but how best to help them understand organization benefits of asset management without typical blinkered view? Yeah, look, that's 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 a, a great question. It's not unusual for executive teams to to focus on themselves and an area of responsibility. Uh, look, they may support uh, the idea because they're told to to go with a herd or but often they don't really appreciate the value to them personally. I mean, this is a challenge we face as asset managers. Current practices are now focusing on asset management as an enterprise solution. Yeah, and that requires coordinated support from the target organizations to succeed. So, you know, if it's not uh, possible to acquire a new type of machinery without employing operators and maintainers with the right qualifications, competency, you know, so that relies on the leadership support from say the human resources team. You know, so without it, the organization suffers poor returns on poten or potential injuries, uh, injuries. So, you know, the HR team are intrinsically, you know, part of that process for success. So, uh, you know, uh, what we try to do there now is take that AM discussion out of that traditional maintenance function and show it as something that they are integral to a success for the business. So uh, if we can try and take that from that uh, operations and, and try and turn it into a, a corporate function, potentially you have the opportunity there to maybe connect to where their value is in that in, in that process when they traditionally didn't recognize that in the past. Yep. Thank Kristen. you. Is, thank you. There is a nice uh, comment here uh, and a question. Can I add, uh, suggest an additional technique? Be truthful. Truth, truthful. Oh, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. That, um, that, uh, you know, we, we sort of mentioned it in, in one way there about uh, knowing your subject and believing it. Um, uh, again, we, we mentioned that, like I said, that in all my life, um, you, know, I, you know, all the executives but one really deserve to be there and they're smart people and they smell, they smell that, you know, that rubbish a mile away. Um, if, uh, if you're not honest, they'll, they'll see it, they'll work it out pretty quick. So, uh, and I think they, you know, my view is they, people respect honesty and integrity, absolutely. Thank you. I will take the last question. Unfortunately, we have more, but time is uh, short. Uh, it's a statement and uh, also a question. We're starting to see change management addressed in our transit asset management TAM plan, federal requirements, especially with proxies at car model, model. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. How do we feel about getting any type of structure, structural change management approach introduced into the organization as a whole? Uh, um, look, that's uh, that is a that's a great great statement, a great question, um, and something. Look, uh, I'm I'm seeing a, a much much stronger reliance on there now to try and 
bring about uh, those effective improvements in operations. Um, a term that we're, we're starting to use here is, is not change management um, because around um, around Australia, a little bit of fatigue about that term. We're using culture transformation. It's a term we've coined recently, um, and getting that uh, that structural change within the organisation to uh, to to not only take that strategic intent but understand the the personal links and the way you need to change the business. So, I personally don't believe um, real asset management is is a change is going to be uh, possible or really effective without having a dual program of that culture transformation with your strategic transformation. I think the two go hand in hand. And I think if uh, you're starting to develop a change program without understanding that support you need from that culture transformation, and that is a that is a, a process very, very different, but must, must work with it, I think your chances of success are going to be uh, significantly limited. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy, for a fantastic presentation. Um, we're at the end of our webinar session. Uh, please feel free to follow up directly with Jamie via the contact details shown on the screen. And I would like to thank all attendees for joining today. Thank you very much for your questions. These will be answered uh, in the next few days. And thank you again, Jamie, for a fantastic presentation. No worries. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks, Sharon, for running the session. Terrific.